thank you very much for the really kind introduction. And it's a, well, really a pleasure to be here in person also. And well, so today we're going to talk about scales. Um, and so I thought what I would do is I would start by showing you a little movie which was made uh, about 10 years ago by uh, Danilo Breshkov, who's an Australian astrophysicist. Uh, but it's actually based, so there are several versions of a similar kind of movie. So the first one that was made, I think, was made in the 60s. Um, and what you see here, so it starts from the very smallest scale. So these are supposed to, that's supposed to be some kind of cartoon of uh, quarks, right? So you know that subatomic particles, you know, the nucleus of an atom is made up of protons and neutrons. And then one believes that protons and neutrons are themselves made up of three quarks. Um, and the little splashes of color here are some sort of a artistic depiction of quarks. And so here, that's the atomic nucleus that's sort of zooming out. And so here in the movie, every second is about a factor 10 in size, right? So we're zooming out by about a factor 10 every second. And so now we're already at the size of, you know, blood cells. Now you see you were getting into an eye, which belongs to a person uh, lying on the lawn somewhere in California, actually. This is the Google campus, I think. Uh, and so you see after a few seconds, well, now you see almost the whole Earth. Uh, and a few more seconds, you see the orbit of the moon. Uh, and now you see sort of the inner planets of the solar system. And now the whole solar system. And a couple more seconds, you see somehow the nearby stars. So that's the nearby stars. Um, and now we see sort of the arm of our galaxy. Now we see our galaxy. Uh, we're going out even more. And so that's sort of clusters of galaxies. And that's the sort of super clusters of galaxies. And now that's the largest scale, which is essentially the whole universe. Right? Um, and one thing which is actually quite striking is that the movie was really short. Right? <laughs> So you see, between the smallest possible scale that we can imagine, which is about the size of a quark, uh, and the largest possible scale we can imagine, which is the size of the whole universe, well, there's about 40 scales. Right? So the movie was about 40 seconds long. Um, and similarly, if we did the same with time instead of, you know, spatial scales with time scales, factor tens in speed, if you want, in duration. Um, then again, sort of the shortest kind of times that we can measure, or that we can imagine, are about you know, the vibrations of subatomic particles. And the longest time that we can imagine is the age of the whole universe, right? sort of the time that elapsed from the Big Bang until now. Um, and again, the ratio between these two is about 10 to the 30 something, right? So again, it's not that much in some sense. There's about 30 orders of magnitude uh, between the smallest time scale that we can imagine and the largest time scale that we can imagine. And so in some sense, what that means is that for all practical purposes, uh, 10 to the 150 is about the largest possible number you can possibly imagine, right? Because it means if we take, you know, if we take the whole history of the whole universe, right? And now we make a kind of a movie, a 3D movie out of it, and you want to record everything, right? And so every single thing, it means that you have your, the size of your pixels is the size of a subatomic particle, right? Uh, and the time resolution is, you know, the vibration of subatomic particles. And so if you take a movie like this, and you want to record the whole history of the whole universe, everything, well, you'd have about 10 to the 150 pixels in that movie. Okay? Uh, so for all practical purposes, 10 to the 150 is infinite. So, so this makes it kind of funny when, you know, so you've all heard this story about the monkey, right? So people say, oh, well, you know, if you put a monkey in front of a typewriter, of course the monkey is going to type nonsense. But if you wait for long enough, the monkey is going to type out the whole works of Shakespeare. Right? Um, and the, the operative word here is long enough. Right? So how long do you have to wait for that? Well, 
if you don't want the whole works of Shakespeare, right? You just want, say, the first page of Shakespeare. Okay, so it's maybe slightly less ambitious goal. Um, well, the number of letters your monkey would have to type before you have a decent chance of actually seeing the first page of Shakespeare is about 10 to the 4,000. Right? So you see, the number of pixels in the movie of the whole history of the universe, all the information that's ever contained and was ever contained in the universe is 10 to the 150. Right? So here we're talking about 10 to the 4,000, which is vastly unimaginably larger than 10 to the 150. Right? So saying that it takes longer than the age of the universe for the monkey to type it out doesn't even begin to cover it. Right? <laughs> so like the, typing once one letter per second for the age of the universe, you get to about, you know, 10 to the 20 something. Um, so, so this is just to you know, give you some sort of idea of you know, what is a large number and what's a small number. Right? So 10 to the 150 is basically infinity. Um, now, what we're going to talk about, what I want to talk about in this lecture is about sort of changes of scale. Right? So it's how how things change when you look at them from a different perspective, if you want. Um, and, well, we're all familiar with the fact that the, uh, the laws of nature, they do actually change as you change scale, right? And so that's a consequence of the fact that they are nonlinear in mathematical language. And, well, as an example here, you see this, you know, little critter um, that you see if you go to a pond in summer, and you see them walking on water. Um, whereas, you know, if humans try that, usually it doesn't really end well. Right? <laughs> so there's a, a famous exception, but usually it doesn't work. Um, and because the reason is that, you know, at human scales, water behaves quite differently from insect scale. Um, and so for the, as far as the insect is concerned, it's as if the water was much more viscous than for us. So it feels more like honey, if you want, than like water. Um, and it's also as if the surface tension of the water is much bigger than for us. So the surface of the water feels much more solid uh, for the insect um, than it feels for us. Right? Now, if you, you know, if I take it sort of something much simpler than laws of nature, so if I just take a picture, for example, um, then changing scales just means you are zooming into the picture. Right? So if I take this picture of the teapot and I zoom in, um, well, you see it kind of gets boring. Right? Um, so after, after a few, you know, one or two orders of magnitude here, you just see a uniform flat sort of colored surface. Um, but there are some pictures that are much more interesting. Right? So of course, you know, many of you have seen that example, uh, which is the uh, Mandelbrot set that was you know, was first explored by Mandelbrot back in the 60s. Um, and so that's an example of what we call a fractal, where you can, if you zoom in at the border of this set, at the boundary, then you can zoom in as far as you want, and you always reveal more detail. So what you see here is that it actually, it always looks a bit similar, right? But it never looks quite the same. Um, and in particular, it always looks interesting. Right? So here, we've zoomed in something like you know, 10 orders of magnitude already, um, and you still see more details. Um, now, on a different, a different example is uh, another completely different system that was uh, first studied by Lawrence, uh, as this gentleman here. So he was a, a British meteorologist. In the 60s, he studied, uh, he came up with a sort of simple model for atmospheric convection, right? So if you want the, you know, the motion of the, the large scale motion of the atmosphere. And okay, I wrote down here the, the equations for this model. It doesn't matter if you're not familiar with uh, differential equations. Um, for the mathematicians in the audience, the main point of these differential equations, you see that they are mostly linear. There is um, a nonlinear bit. This thing somehow doesn't work very well. Um, 
there's a nonlinear bit. I'm going to try to show it here. There's a nonlinear bit, which is this product here, and there's this x times z product. Um, the nonlinear part has the property that it preserves the norm. It preserves somehow the distance from the origin for these three points. The linear part tends to point in. So solutions to this uh, equation look like this. Well, it's a three-dimensional, right? So there are three components, x, y, z. So the solution is a point, the motion of a point in three-dimensional space. And this here is just you know, this three-dimensional motion viewed from one side. Um, and what one sees here, you see this kind of complicated picture. Um, and this was one of the first if you want, appearance or discoveries of uh, chaos, if you want. And so what is chaotic here is that you know, if you, you, start from any, you start from any initial condition. So you start from any point in space, and then you run this evolution, so you get some curve in space. Um, it's always going to, you know, so you have these two leaves. It looks a little bit like the wings of a butterfly, right? The solution is always going to get close to these two wings of this butterfly. Um, and it's going to kind of wind around it. So it's going to more or less, you know, wind around here for a bit, and then it switches over. It winds around here for a bit, then it switches over again. Um, and in principle, everything is completely determined by where you start at the beginning, right? So everything is completely deterministic. There's nothing random. Um, but in practice, it's essentially impossible to actually predict whether you're going to end up at a given time, whether you end up on the right side, you know, on the right wing, if you want, of the butterfly, or in the left wing of the butterfly um, after you know, more than just a few revolutions. Um, and the reason for this is that, you know, if you want to know after somehow time t whether you end up in the left-hand side or on the right-hand side, then the precision that you would need for the initial position is about 10 to the minus, you know, 0 0.4 times t. And so you see if t is, 200, well, then that's 10 to the minus 80 or something, which is zero for all practical purposes, right? So we've seen that the ratio between the size of the universe and subatomic distances is 10 to the minus 40. Right? So even if you have that kind of precision, well, you can only predict where you end up uh, up to time about 100, right? So if t is 100, then you get 10 to the minus 40 here. So, so it's completely impossible to predict simply because there's no way you can fix the initial position with a sufficiently high precision because you would need a precision which is just completely unattainable. Um, and then the question is, you know, if you're in situations like this, is it still possible to say something interesting um, about how these kind of systems behave? Right? Now, in this particular example, well, there are very in several interesting things that one can still say, and it's, been, it's a very well-studied example, of course. Um, so here I want to focus on one aspect, if you want. And so what I did here in, on this picture is I interpret, so remember there's, the first coordinate is essentially the one which you know, tells you whether you're in the right wing or in the left wing of the butterfly, right? So it's sort of... Roughly, the right wing is centered around 1 and the left one around minus 1 or something like this. And then what I do is I interpret that coordinate as a speed. Um, so if you're on the right, in the right wing, then basically you go up at speed roughly 1. If you're in the left wing, you go down at speed roughly 1. And then I plot the corresponding position. Right? So, so here you see this curve. Uh, so time here is plotted horizontally. Vertically, you have the position, and you see that you know, here it sort of goes up at a certain speed, then it continues going up. That basically means you were sort of in the right wing. Then it goes down, which basically means you're in the left wing. Then it goes up again, means you're in the right wing, etc. Okay. So if you do that for a longer time, you see something like that. 
Um, if you do it for an even longer time, you see something like that. And even longer time, it looks like this. Well, you see that the two last pictures, well, they sort of look the same, right? I mean, they're obviously not the same picture, but they kind of look the same. Um, and they also basically look random, right? So, so now you have this more or less random looking picture here. Um, and so you can ask, well, can you still say something about this you know, random looking picture? Um, well, so there's another very simple procedure that produces a similar kind of random looking picture, right? Which is that what I could do is I could say, well, instead of solving this differential equations that I wrote down and then doing this complicated procedure of interpreting this as a velocity and then integrating it up, uh, I could just do coin tosses, right? So I just toss a coin. Uh, whenever it comes up heads, say I win a pound. If it comes up tails, I lose a pound. And then I just plot you know, the amount of money in my wallet uh, as a function of time. So first, say it comes up heads, so the amount of money goes up by one. Uh, then it comes up heads again, it goes up again, and so on. And so you get, you know, you get some kind of random looking curve like this. Um, and so now if I do this, instead of doing it a dozen times, um, I do it, you know, 3,000 times. Well, I get another sort of random looking curve. And you see that it, it looks very, very similar to the other random looking curve, right? So um, one thing is that you, know, you can ask yourself, what's, so typically, if I do that you know, 3,000 times, typically, how much money is going to be in my wallet? Well, either I will have won something or I will have lost something. But the amount I will have won or lost will be roughly of the order square root of 3,000. Right? So that's actually um, that's a, a theorem. It's a consequence of something called the central limit theorem is one of the sort of most famous theorems in probability theory. And uh, actually what this central limit theorem in some sense also tells us is that there are many, many, many systems that when you look at them over these long time periods, they actually look the same. They look like these random curves that look exactly like that random curve, right? So if you look at stock prices, for example, they look very similar to that. Um, and so, well, you know, like the mechanism, at least on, unless there are somehow systemic kind of shocks in the market or something like this, right? So if the market is just chugging along, uh, then the mechanism for stock prices is roughly the same as this, right? There are people buying and selling stocks. It sort of happens more or less randomly. Every time you sell a stock, uh, the price of the stock goes up a little bit. Every, every time you buy it, oh no, it goes the other way around. Every time you sell it, it goes down a little bit. Every time you buy it, it goes up a little bit, right? So the, so the stock price sort of fluctuates randomly. Um, and you, know, you see essentially the same kind of random looking curve, but it's not just similar looking, right? So it's really, there are, you can make, compare statistics on these curves and they're really the same statistics. Um, so so this, was a, this is something that was actually, to some extent, uh, studied a lot during the turn of the century, the last century, so in the early 1900s. And that study actually grew out from an experiment of um, a, uh, a biologist called Brown. And what he did is he observed pollen particles under a microscope back in the 1820s. And what he found is that he saw that these little particles, so it wasn't really, it was sort of like bits of grains that are even smaller than grains of pollen that he was observing under the microscope. And he saw that they were actually moving around. Right? So he looked at them under the microscope and they were sort of, they performed some kind of jittery motion. And so he was wondering where that motion comes from. Right? And, uh, so in the beginning, what he thought is that maybe these particles were actually alive, that they were like some kind of little bacteria or something. Uh, but then you know, he figured out that that was clearly not the case because he just left it for you know, a week or so in his lab without any food or light or anything. And that would have killed anything alive, if you want. Um, and whereas these particles were still 
performing the same jittery motions when he was looking at them under the microscope. Um, and so, of course, the explanation that then, you know, was came as a consensus, if you want, later is that uh, the reason why these particles perform this motion uh, is really because water molecules don't stay still. Water molecules behave really a little bit like billiard balls. They sort of bounce around and they bounce off each other all the time. Uh, and that's actually what temperature is. So if you want the temperature of your water is essentially something like the average speed of the molecules of water uh, that are sort of bouncing around. And, and now what happens is that you have your grain of pollen and you have all these water molecules that sort of zoom around uh, in your glass of water. And every time a molecule bounces off the grain of pollen, it pushes it a little bit in one direction. And right? of course, a mo water molecule is really tiny, tiny. Uh, and the grain of pollen is, well, it's tiny for us, but it's really big compared to a molecule. Uh, so it doesn't really have much of an effect, but there are billions and billions of water molecules, right? And so the cumulative effect of all these water molecules sort of bouncing off the grain of pollen, that's enough to actually make it move uh, sufficiently so that you can actually observe it under a microscope, right? And you don't need sort of huge magnification to observe that. Um, and, and so then in the uh, early 1900s, actually independently, both Einstein, uh, who you all know, is the first gentleman here, and uh, Smolushovsky, they both independently came up with a more quantitative theory of Brownian motion. Right? So the description is the one I just told you about the water molecules bouncing off the pollen particles. Um, and, but they came up with a more quantitative description and a mathematical description. So they were basically saying that, ah, actually you can write down an equation for the probability of seeing, so the, the motion of this pollen particle is kind of random and erratic, but so what you can ask yourself is, if I see it at a certain location at a certain moment of time, and then I wait for a little bit, what's the probability of seeing it at some given other location at later times? And then that probability, which is now a function of time and of space, right? This is the probability of seeing it at a given location at a given time. Uh, so this probability actually solves an equation which is called the heat equation because it's the same equation as the one that's solved by heat spreading in a solid body, right? So if you put some heat up, you take say a piece of metal which is cold and then you heat it up somewhere and then you ask yourself how does the temperature change so the heat kind of spreads out uh, in your piece of metal, then there's also an equation describing that and it gives you also a function of time and space which is the temperature at a given time different location. And that equation is exactly the same as the equation that describes the probability of seeing uh, the pollen particles at a given location at a given time. Um, and now, the interesting thing here, so why was this important, actually, this experiment? Well, uh, and this, so first, um, Einstein and Smoluchowski, they came with sort of, not just with this qualitative description, and also not just with the heat equation, they actually came even with a prediction of the coefficients of the heat that show up in the heat equation, right? So it was very quantitative. Um, and so in principle, so then you can actually do an experiment. You can check whether that prediction really matches the experiment. And the, important, the importance of this experiment is that at the time, uh, which is not that long ago, right? It was 120 years ago. At the time, even though it was reasonably well accepted that matter is made of atoms and molecules, it wasn't, you know, there hadn't been an experiment for which you didn't have any other explanation, right? And so this was the first experiment where there was simply no other explanation available, if you want, on the market um, than the one that you know, postulates that matter is made of atoms and molecules. And so that really settled that debate, right? So, so at the time it was already kind of quite well established, but there were always people saying, oh, but actually you could always explain that in different ways. Um, and so Perrin in 1908, 
he actually did the experiment, and you know it matches quite well uh, the predictions of Einstein and Smoluchowski. And so he actually got the Nobel Prize for that in the uh, in the early 20s. Um, and, and finally, so Bachelier, so he, about simultaneously, actually a little, a few years earlier, so he came at exactly the same mathematics from a completely different perspective um, because he was interested in, you know, more like the evolution of stock prices, right? The example that I just mentioned to you earlier. Um, and so what he did in his PhD was to, you know, try to derive some kind of predictions for the evolution of stock prices. And, and of course, he came up with, you know, more or less the story that I just told you, you know, people buying and selling stocks, and depending on whether you buy or sell, it goes up or down. Um, and he made this quantitative as well, and then he derived the same heat equation in exactly the same way as if you want Einstein and Smoluchowski derived it for the, uh, for the Brownian motion. So, so now that, because laid the foundations of, if you want, of modern quantitative mathematical finance, uh, so then later Black and Scholes, of course, built on that work. Um, they got a Nobel Prize for that. Bachelier never really got much out of it. Um, he didn't even get a job out of it. But so he was really not terribly lucky. Um, but so, so the point of this story is that you have, right, so you have two completely different situations, two completely different motivations, right? So Bachelier was interested in stock prices. Einstein and Smoluchowski were interested in describing Brownian motion. Um, and they both come up with the same description, right? So, they have, so there's a story that has similar sort of at some sort of qualitative level, it's a similar story, right? Whether you have people buying or selling stocks and therefore driving the price up and down, or molecules, water molecules bouncing off the pollen and then pushing it right or left, uh, you know, you can clearly see the analogy, right? Sort of the stock price is the same as the pollen uh, and the uh, people buying and selling stocks are the same as the water molecules. So it's a similar kind of story the details are, of course, vastly different because people and water molecules are obviously not the same thing. Um, but you end up with you know, some quantitative predictions and they actually work out. And uh, you end up with the same mathematical object. So the, the idealized mathematical object that you end up with, uh, so here, that's the idealized mathematical object, right? So that's the... That's if you want a realization of Brownian motion. So that's if you take, for example, if you do this you know, thing about the coin tosses, but now you do like infinitely many coin tosses, right? And then you draw what you get when you do infinitely many of them infinitely fast. You get some kind of random continuous curve. Um, and here what I do is I just, you know, I took one sample of that random curve uh, and then I just, zooming out, right? And so what you see is that, well, so first it has some kind of fractal structure also, right? In the sense that I can zoom out as much as I want here, and it always looks somewhat interesting, right? It never becomes just flat or something like this. Right? If you take a, um, and of course the movie goes both ways, right? I could also zoom in as much as I want, and it basically looks the same, right? Uh, so it's not like, for example, if you take a smooth curve and I zoom in, at some point it basically just looks like a straight line and then it continues looking like a straight line and it doesn't change anymore, right? So here you can zoom out and in as much as you want. It always changes, so in some sense it always looks interesting. Um, the other thing is you see, so here there's this kind of parabola which doesn't move. Uh, what this is supposed to illustrate is the fact that the way we're zooming out is a little bit different from what you might think of as zooming out in the sense that if we zoom out by a certain factor horizontally, we have to zoom out by the square root of that factor vertically, right? So if we zoom out by a factor 100 horizontally, we only zoom out by a factor 10 vertically, okay? So that's the way of zooming which keeps that parabola fixed, 
Whereas if you want your normal way of zooming, where you zoom out in the same way horizontally and vertically, that would keep like straight lines fixed instead of keeping parabolas fixed. Right? <coughs> so, so that's the way of zooming, which is such that this idealized random curve, right, this Brownian motion, always looks interesting, always looks the same, if you want. Okay, so, um, so here, if you want, so Wilson, so that's now everything I told you so far was, if you want, prehistory of mathematics, right? It was sort of 18th century stuff or early uh, 19th century or early 20th century stuff. Um, Wilson, so he was a physicist um, and did a lot of his work back in the 80s, 1980s. Uh, so, so he actually really kind of revolutionized theoretical physics by, by saying, well, actually, you know, the story that I've just told you about Brownian motion and, you know, you have somehow different, uh, many different kind of systems you can come up, come from very different motivations, very different perspectives. Um, and you see that, you know, you can still derive this Brownian motion in different contexts. Well, there are different such stories that you can tell. Okay. Um, and so the, the picture that has sort of emerged, if you want, during the 20th century is that there are sort of a number of what physicists call universality classes. And so one of them being the Brownian universality class. And the universality class, if you want, is a sort of like a whole collection of physical system or physical situations or mathematical models um, that have the property that when you look at what happens, you know, at large scales, when you're interested in, you know, zooming out, uh, then they all behave actually in the same way. Okay. And the perspective that Wilson somehow and Fisher also and so on introduced uh, was that he was somehow thinking of that operation of zooming out as being a little bit like a dynamical system where the, you know, the space of your dynamical system is the space of physical models, uh, but where you fix the scale. And then you say the two models are close if their predictions at scales of order one or at the fixed scale are close. And then zooming out means changing the scale. And so even if two models are the same, when you look at them at different scales, as we've already seen, they can actually become pretty far from each, each other, right? Um, and so what Wilson then, and you know, not just him, of course, of this, it's a very big chunk of uh, theoretical physics. Um, so what they then argued is that, well, what's interesting is to actually study the fixed points of the operation of zooming out, which is sort of those physical models or those mathematical models that, you know, you can zoom out and in as much as you want, and they always, in some sense, look the same. Uh, and that's exactly what we've seen with this, uh, this Brownian motion, right? So there's this idealized mathematical model, which is this, the one where I showed you, I just showed you the movie, which has the property that you can zoom in and out as much as you want, it sort of almost always looks the same. So of course that's an idealized mathematical model. You'd never see something exactly like that in the real world, but it's a very good object that describes, that approximates things that you do see in the real world, you know, like stock prices or something like that. Right? Um, and of course what's, you know, the, the point of still having that idealized model is that the idealized mathematical object is somewhat simpler. Right? So it's somehow simple to describe. Um, and it's a relatively good model for, you know, a number of different situations in the real world. You know, it's like a circle, you know, there's no, there are no real circles in the world, right? If you take a round table, it's never really round. It's just approximately round, but of course it's still, you know, useful to actually be able to study the idealized object, which is a mathematical circle. And for example, we know that, I don't know, the ratio between the diameter and the circumference is pi. And you know, if you measure it for a table, it's going to be approximately pi. It's never going to be exactly that. 
uh, but it's still important as an approximation. And so it's the same here. So you try to find idealized mathematical objects that are good approximations for, if you want, many physical situations. And the reason why they should be good approximations for many physical situations is that they have this property of being invariant under the operation of changing scale. And therefore, they have a chance of showing up as limits of the operation of zooming out. Right? Um, and so to some extent, that goes a little bit in the direction of trying to somehow you know, understand. You know, there's a fa famous essay uh, that was written by Wigner in the, I think, in the 50s or something, uh, which was written called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences, right? Sort of the question being, how comes that mathematics is actually so good at describing nature, or at predicting uh, nature? And, you know, in some sense, this goes a little bit in the direction of explaining this, right? Um, so, so now in the sort of last few minutes, um, I want to actually describe another kind of a universality class, right? So we've talked about this Brownian motion, uh, which shows up naturally, and that was discovered over 100 years ago. Um, and that showed up in situations where, you know, you look at things that depend on time, and where, in some sense, you have somehow random things that you add up in a certain way, right? So, sort of like in all the... In, in the examples that I gave you so far, in some sense, it's always random phenomena that get integrated up in some sense. Um, now, here the example I want to talk about is the one where you look at now situations that depend both on time and on space. So, for example, the kind of situation you should have in mind is, well, like on the slide here, like a forest fire, where so what do you see here? Well, you see a flame front. Okay? And of course, on the left of the flame front, you have the part of the forest that is burned down. You know? And well, on the right of the flame front, there's the part which hasn't burned down yet. And the flame front is going to move, basically, from left to right. And it's going to move in a slightly random way. Right? Because, well, you see already the flame front is not quite straight. And there's obviously some bits that burn a bit faster than other bits. And so sometimes it moves a bit faster, sometimes it moves a bit slower. So there's some kind of average speed at which it's going to burn. But then there are fluctuations on top of that average speed. Right? Um, so there are other situations like this. So for example, this picture here. Uh, is taken, so that's an actual experiment that goes back about 10 years ago uh, from Takeuchi and his group, uh, where what they do is they take a liquid crystal, and it's a liquid crystal, so liquid crystal, you know, just like you have in LCD displays, um, and it comes in two different phases, and you can optically tell the difference between the two, like it has different color, right? So you, Kind of see the difference whether it's in one phase or the other and one of the two phases is more stable than the other one and so what you do is you prepare it in the unstable one and and then what you do is you zap a laser beam on it and when the laser where the laser beam hits the liquid crystal it gives it enough energy uh, to switch over from the unstable phase to the stable phase Right, so then it becomes stable, and so the stable is, I don't know, say the dark one, and the unstable, the light one. And so you're basically drawing a dark line, if you want, with your laser on that liquid crystal. But then since the dark region is more stable than the light one, it's actually going to invade it. Right? So, basically, so in the experiment, what you do is you basically draw a dark line with the laser uh, on your liquid crystal. The liquid crystal is basically two-dimensional, right? You think of really like a display, LCD display. And then that dark line is going to fatten out, right? because it's more stable than the light surroundings. And so it's going to invade the surroundings. Uh, and so it gets fatter and fatter. 
And again, it does so in a slightly random way. So it starts off very straight, but then some bits go a little bit faster, some bits go a little bit slower, and so it starts to actually um, develop some fluctuations. And you know, again, the question is, is there an idealized mathematical model that describes these fluctuations? And what is that mathematical model? And you can come up with all sorts of you know, toy models that do the same thing. So here, um, you know, one kind of nice toy model is, well, I'm going to actually show you what the model is. Uh, so it's this, right? So, the, so here the model is that you just have, right? So you see, obviously, these are Tetris bricks, right? Um, and so the model here is just that you have Tetris bricks falling down. Um, and you don't play Tetris, right? So they just, they just pile up. Right? So, obvious, so that's what happens if you don't make any effort at Tetris. Right? So if you don't make any effort, you, you're never going to get a whole line that's filled up. Uh, so they just pile up in this way. Um, but then you, know, you can ask yourself, what does this pile of Tetris bricks kind of look like if you have really, really lots of them? Right, so here, here there's already quite a few, but there's, there's really not that many. Uh, so you can actually, you know, so really here there's, there's many, many Tetris bricks here. Right, so now they're piling up. There's like, a, well, up there you see there's like 10 million Tetris bricks per second that fall down. Um, and so, so let me pause that or somebody's going to get a seizure. Um, <laughs> So, so you see here you have all these millions and millions of Tetris bricks that are piled up. Uh, and you see at the top here, well, there's sort of the top of that pile of bricks. And the top of the pile of bricks at that scale where you have, <clears throat> so I think horizontally there's maybe a couple thousand or maybe 3,000 bricks or something like that. Um, at that scale, you see that the top of that pile of bricks actually looks kind of like a continuous curve. So when we you know, when we zoomed in at the beginning, uh, you know, here, so sort of at that kind of level, it doesn't really look very continuous, the top of the pile of bricks. Uh, but at the very large scale, it really looks like a nice continuous curve here, right? Um, and again, you see that, you know, at some sort of high level, the mechanism is somewhat similar, right? So there's one region here with Tetris bricks, there's a region above with no Tetris bricks. The region below invades the region above, right? It goes only in one direction. Um, clearly, it happens in a somewhat random way because the Tetris bricks fall down in a random way, and so occasionally there might be more of them falling down in one region and less in another region. So some bits grow a bit faster and some bits grow a bit slower. Um, and, you know, so, so again, is there like an idealized mathematical model that describes uh, the fluctuations of the top of that pile of bricks in a kind of idealized way, where if you, if you had like infinitely many bricks and they're infinitely small and you really have some kind of continuous curve that describes the top of that pile. Right? So that turns out to be a sort of, actually an incredibly hard mathematical question. So there's, um, in the case of this Tetris, I mean, it's, you know, it's a cute little toy model, this Tetris bricks falling down. There's even the easier version where the bricks are kind of size one, uh, but they're allowed to stick to neighbors. Uh, because if they don't stick to neighbors and they have size one, they, didn't, they don't do anything interesting. But if they stick to neighbors, then that's actually a model that physicists have studied a lot, which is called ballistic deposition. And turns out even now, mathematicians are hardly able to say anything rigorously about it. Um, so there's, you know, for the, for the young people in the audience, there's a lot of things to do there, right? Um, now, because the physicists can tell us, you know, what actually happens. It's just there's no proof that this is what actually goes on. Uh, and so what physicists tell us is that, well, there is, there are really two universality classes here, uh, depending on whether the situation is a symmetric one or not. So the, the examples that I gave you are very asymmetric, right? So there's always one region that invades the other region. 
Okay, so, so it goes in one direction and it never goes back in the other direction. You could imagine other situations of the same type where the interface can kind of move in both directions sort of equally likely. Okay? Um, and so what physicists tell us is that, well, yeah, there should be actually two, there are two idealized mathematical models, one that's called Edwards Wilkinson, and that one is easy to describe. That one, if you want, is really the analog of this Brownian motion. So the description of that one, it's like a space-time version, if you want, of this Brownian motion. It's described in very much the same way. Um, whereas in the, the situation that's asymmetric, where one side invades the other one, um, what physicists believe, and there's no reason not to trust them, is that uh, there is one universality class that describes this situation, and that's called the KPZ universality class. So that's named after Kaldar, Parisi, and Jan, who wrote about this in the mid-80s. Um, and what one believes here is that, right, so that's if you want this Wilsonian picture, where the, uh, you know, the board or the screen is the space of all possible models of interface fluctuation, and arrows are the operation of zooming out. And then as you zoom out, any of these models, the belief is that it either converges to this KPZ fixed point or to this edwards Wilkinson model, depending basically on whether things are symmetric or not. Right? Um, so then, so for example, even the fact that this guy exists you know, some sort of mathematical description of this object, that's an extremely recent result. So that's a result by Matetsky, Remenick, and Quastel for about five years ago, right? And that's just about the description. So it's not, uh, you know, what people would believe is that, well, if you take a pile of Petris bricks and you zoom out, then it converges to this object. There's no theorem like that. Uh, but at least there is a description of the thing that one believes it converges to if we if we zoom out, right, so, as we did in the movie just now. Um, now, in that picture, what it suggests here is that the guy in the middle, this, the one, the symmetric case, is somehow less stable, right, because it's, symmetric one requires more symmetry, right, so by default you would have less symmetry uh, so as soon as you perturb things a little bit, they would become less symmetric, um, and then they should converge to the other one, to so this KPZ guy. Um, and so then you can ask yourself, you know, is there a line that connects them, or is that, you know, in two dimensions it will always be a line, but of course this is supposed to be the space of all physical situations, and that's not two-dimensional, that's sort of infinite dimensional. It's something one doesn't even quite know what it is, but uh, it's certainly infinite dimensional. And then, you know, you can ask yourself, is there one line or many lines maybe that connect this Edwards Wilkinson to KPZ, you know, that sort of converge to one as you zoom out to the other one as you zoom in, and they would somehow interpolate between the two situations. Um, and so here, that's something that well, I've been personally involved in, uh, where we now know how to describe that, for example, right? So we know that there is, so the conjecture is that there is exactly one idealized mathematical object that interpolates between these two, um, and that's called the KPZ equation that was already, if you want, described by uh, Kadar, Parisi, and Zhang in the 80s. Um, but what we do now have is we, you know, we have actually mathematical theorems that tell us that there are really many uh, models that you can take if you make them almost symmetric and then you kind of zoom out and you zoom out just far enough so that you start to see the effect of the asymmetry, then they always converge to this KPZ equation. So that suggests that it's really a one-dimensional line if you want in this abstract picture of all physical models. There's a one-dimensional line if you want that connects these two universality classes, right? So that's, if you want to, so I just try to give you, you know, some sort of idea of like what's the state of the art in, you know, one corner of this story. Um, there's, 
you know, obviously a lot of things that, are, that people, mathematicians, are still working in, in this direction under the you know, guidance of physicists who have lots of that stuff already worked out in some sense, um, but not always. So, for example, that description of this KPZ fixed point was really found by mathematicians, and uh, that was not, not derived by physicists before, actually. Um, and so, uh, you know, I hope you found this interesting, and as you, you know, it might maybe some of the young people in the audience might sort of motivate you to uh, see that there are still lots of things that actually need to be done here, and you know, that you can uh, work on and teach us. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.